Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, the Bitch You channel where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Well, I've got your attention. I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch stores on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. So, yep. Yet another video on education in the United States, and this will make my fifth video on the subject, and there are links to the others in my description box. I am generally of the opinion that we are into our second, possibly our third, generation of Americans who weren't educated. Now, I've previously kind of been on the fence with regarding my own generation. I mean, I know for a fact that we didn't receive as much education as our parents and grandparents. But after watching a few more of those man-on-the-street interviews about things that every American should know but they don't, I'm no longer on the fence. I now include my own generation as our third straight of, ig of illiterate ignorami. They can neither read, nor write, nor perform the most basic math. Now, for decades, of course, I've known that I wasn't as well educated as my parents and my grandparents. I mean, what I've learned of history, American or otherwise, has been totally self-taught. And similarly, my command of the English language was self-learned over the course of about 30 years posting online. And this predates the internet, goes all the way back to dial-up bulletin board systems and 300 bits per second. And I know why it's gotten this bad. And it's because, I know because I've been in and around education for my entire life. And I got to see the deterioration happen right before my very eyes. But to understand... You know, how I know this deterioration has happened involves a rather lengthy trip down memory lane that it, in some ways I'd almost rather not take. When I was in third grade, my parents made the decision to take me out of the public school system. There were a number of reasons for this, but the one that was always communicated to me was that I was not doing well in school because I wasn't being challenged. So from fourth through sixth grade, I intend, attended Brownell Talbot School, a private parochial prep school in Omaha, Nebraska. My parents had told me before sending me there that I would probably find it a lot more challenging than public school had been, and they were absolutely right. Now, Brownell Talbot started life as a boarding school in sort of the British um, public school tradition. And as you can see, my slideshow is showing it here. Um, it probably was as close as you could get to that anywhere in Nebraska, certainly, and possibly anywhere in the U.S. Now, it hasn't been a boarding school since sometime in the 20th century when Omaha's population, which is today about a million people, rose to the point where it could sustain itself as a non-boarding school. So today, Brown L. Talbot sports lower, middle, and upper, class, upper schools running all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade. Now, as you can see, occasionally as it goes past in my uh, slideshow, we did have uniforms. <laughs> there we are. Boys like myself had blue blazers, um, blue dress slacks, and we wore white dress shirts and ties. And then the girls had plaid skirts, blouses, and stockings. I feel rather lucky, frankly, that pictures of me from this era, era very few survive. Um, this was the 1970s, and boys, even in private schools, wore bell bottoms and what we'd probably call platform shoes today. And the fact that we did have these uh, uniforms is one of the reasons I'm not entirely against school uniforms. I don't think it's a bad thing to be at least comfortable dressing in a suit and a tie. But this wasn't a Catholic school, although we did have some re religious rituals. The headmaster and his staff were some level of seminar Samarians, and they had, you know, collars and everything. Our days began with the Pledge of Allegiance and a prayer. We attended chapel every Wednesday, which is the beautiful building that you see occasionally coming by here on my slideshow. Um, and this included, by the way, even the Jewish children had to attend, and those of us whose faith was, um, I don't know, diminutive in the first place, and maybe we wound up being uh, atheists later in life, as I have. We did have a ritualistic way of uh, eating that involved all of us. We had assigned tables. We'd all stand in front of our chairs until everyone got through the lunch line and sat, stood it before their ta chairs. Then we would sit down. This was a little later in life, so the men didn't hold out the chairs for women. We'd take our seats, we'd have a prayer led by anybody who happened to want to take the job. Usually we took uh, turns, and then we started eating. So now understand that when I speak about Brown L. Talbot, I'm talking about my own experience with it in the mid-1970s. My own experience is probably a bit unique. And I will certainly preface anything that I'm about to say with the plug that if it is still as academically challenging today as it was in the mid-1970s, 
then this is where your kid should be going to school. Now tuition at that time, and probably still is, was extremely high. It was so high that when a position opened up for a fourth grade teacher, my mother was able to get hired on, and this allowed my parents to send both my sister and I to the school tuition free. And because of the really high tuition, the children in my grade and probably everywhere else were without exception from extremely affluent families. The poorest among them had very successful attorneys for fathers, and the richest well, I remember being invited to somebody's uh, birthday one time, and his family was so affluent that to me, at least at that time and place, it seemed like he had essentially a castle to live in. It was big enough that it actually had secret hallways, you know, leading from one room to another that were originally used by servants and stuff back in the day. So I wasn't from anything like a wealthy family. My parents struggled very hard during that period to put me to school there. It was my mother's being hired that came as a gigantic financial relief. And as a consequence, I started out with a couple of problems. Firstly, I was, have been, and always will be a geek. And while the Big Bang Theory has made geek chic, at least for a little while, at that time, wearing a Star Trek t-shirt made you a good candidate for a beating. And secondly, of course, I was from um, the perspective of the students, very poor. Now, understand that I did grow up in a middle-class family, but to them, oh, God, I was poor. I wasn't treated very well while I was there by the students. I was bullied for both of those reasons, though, you know, as a Star Trek fan, which at that time was a dead TV show, bullying was hardly unknown to me. So, it wasn't um, just me. Either. It wasn't just me they picked on. Now again, I cannot speak for the school today, nor the campus experience for anyone other than myself at that time and place. However, at that time and the place, the students in my class could be complete grade A drenholes. I was young, so I don't know for certain. But I believe that my class was responsible for our fifth grade teacher only lasting one year at the school. We were completely merciless to him. And unfortunately, in an effort to fit in, I was pretty damn merciless myself. So for two years, my mother taught fourth grade at Brownell Talbot, in addition to having experienced the educational difference between public and an exclusive private school. This was my introduction to education as a field, because of course my mother would be coming home with papers to grade and all of that, and so I had some conception of what was going on behind the scenes. My mother's contract wasn't renewed, at which point my sister and I switched back to public schools. So from seventh grade through high school, I was in an average public school of that era. But even then, I could tell that I wasn't being taught as much as I would have been at Brownell Talbot. However, my experience there had taught me how to learn on my own, something most of my generation and later would never learn. I was probably the first generation of American children to get an education in spite of, rather than because of, the system. Uh, and in fact, you know, it was because of the fact that I had been trained in Brownell Talbot how to study and how to educate myself. And even then, in public schools, my history, my English, virtually any other subject except mathematics was threadbare. And my mathematics was, again, really only because of Brownell Talbot and my mother. When I got into public school, I was so far ahead of the other students in math that my mother kept her teaching certificate so that she could tutor me. In my final year of middle school, I actually went off campus to a high school for math. And I went through the first semester of calculus, and you could have gone through the second semester. I didn't, but it was offered in high school at that time. And while French was still offered as an elective in public schools, I found myself consistently the best speaker because it had been a requirement for three years, from fourth to sixth grade at Brownell Talbot. I am still conversant in the language, borderline on, um, you know, fluent in it. And I do watch some French language uh, uh, YouTube channels just to keep my hand in. So as I say, my campus experience at Brown Hill Talbot was anything other than ideal, but it did prepare me to get an education in public schools that was unique to anyone other than probably my sister, and for the same reasons. I went on to study theater at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, the Cornhuskers. And after being marginally successful in theater as a profession, I ultimately quit before earning my degree, and I went to Chicago to try to make it as a theatrical actor. I discovered very early on that I liked money a hell of a lot more than constant auditions that led nowhere, which is what most actors do. And at the same time, I met my ex-wife, and she was in computer science. And this had always been one of my avid interests, and so I ended up getting both an associate's and bachelor's degree in computer science. 
I must always, by the way, mention that despite our many tensions in the latter part of our marriage and after our divorce, I credit my ex with helping me get a much better education. She had been in the field for years, so I could run anything that I did, having any kind of trouble with past, or I didn't wait around to see an instructor, I could just ask her. And on a number of occasions, she would tell me that I needed to go back and redo something that would have been passed with a perfectly acceptable passing grade, but because they wouldn't allow you to do that in the real world. So in 1999, by which point I had uh, two wonderful children of my own, my ex and I moved to the Sioux City, Iowa area. And our children attended a local Catholic school from kindergarten until our divorce, at which time my ex took the kids and moved back to Chicago. And at that point they went to local public schools. Now I knew things had started to go south in my children's education when they would both repeatedly tell me that they were now being taught things in their public school that they had already been taught years earlier in their Catholic school. And I knew it had gone completely off the rails in high school. One of them told me about a skit that they were producing for a sophomore history class that involved cardboard and construction paper for things like props and costumes. I was totally flabbergasted by that. I still am. Cardboard and construction paper in high school. I mean, as bad as my education may have been, I can't imagine anything like that. Now, fortunately, most of my children are extremely bright, and like Brownell Talbot had done for me, their Catholic school had taught them how to self-educate. And they both ended up graduating at the tops of their classes, both in high school and in college. One of them is now pursuing her doctorate, and I'm sure that she's going to be very successful. The other is working in the video game field at, in an artistic capacity. And to be honest, I'm kind of jealous of both of them. They're both way more intelligent than I, with one of them doing things academically than I could only dream of. I have it a couple of times kicked around getting a PhD, but I've never done it. And the other is actually making her living as an artist, something that I certainly could never do. So years, years later, I took a significant pay cut to become an IT instructor at a technical school. I almost always refer to this place as the place that shall not be named because it was thoroughly and completely and appropriately discredited. However, in the interests of full disclosure, it was the late and unlamented ITT Technical Institute. Now, while the school's degrees are now discredited, I want to preface my involvement a couple of ways. Firstly, I was not aware of ITT Tech's really horrifying business practices until my last two quarters. And when my rather completely unsurprising uh, termination came, I was frankly rather glad to see the back of the place. Secondly, and most importantly, I never played the kind of grading games that tended to go on there. Instructors and campuses both were rated largely on the number of butts in the seats in any given night and how many of those butts passed the course. And the place became something of a degree mill because of it. However, I was the only full-time IT instructor at that small campus. I held a near dictatorship over my students' academic life. If I taught at a professional level, if you earned an F, you got an F. If you were an A, you got an A. I never cut corners, as it evidenced by the number of dropouts that we had. Very consistently, we'd get about 80 new students for the program in each quarter. Two years later, eight or less would have graduated. Now, to any of my students who may happen to watch this, your employer may think that your degree is worthless. However, if I taught you, then you received an education that made you competent. I am happy to see that this has, in fact, occasionally borne out fruit because I bump into former students who are now working in the field. Now, ITT Tech had no appreciable entrance requirements, which was why so few of my students ended up completing the program. If you had a warm body and you could pay for a student loan, which, by the way, they provided via their own sister company, that's part of the reason that they were so thoroughly discredited, well, you'd be allowed in if you had that. I entirely understand that with some standout exceptions, I was not generally dealing with the cream of the crop. Nobody from Brownell Tablet was going to ITT Technical Institute. That was a prep school. They were, off, they were off at some Ivy League college somewhere. My consistently best students were veterans. A lot of them were coming back from Iraq. They had seen their fair share of shit. They knew what they wanted, and they were concentrating on getting it. And there were some standouts who came out of the public schools, but they were pretty few and far between. The overwhelming majority were actually illiterate. Now, I don't say that hyperbolically. I mean that they could neither read nor write nor perform the most basic math. 
I was consistently and frustratingly bumping into this fact as an IT instructor. In that field, everything devolves to the binary numbering system consisting of ones or zeros. If you don't understand the normal base 10 mathematics, it is all but impossible to teach binary, never mind hexadecimal, which is a base 16 numbering system. Some of the standout stories that I usually like to um, tell people about, if you've seen my other videos on this, you'll see, heard this and you'll hear it again. I once had a student who needed tutoring. Now, when I arrived at the tutoring session, I asked the student to get out their textbook. They hadn't brought them with, they hadn't brought it with them. So while I wasn't teaching the course that quarter, I had by that point taught all of the courses at some point or another. So I went in my office and I got my own textbook. I, I then asked them where they'd gotten lost. Well, this was week 11 of a 12-week course, and they just dumped out their backpack, and it turned out that they'd done absolutely nothing since the first week of the class. Well, you know, you know it's just a death sentence at that point, but as an instructor, you got to try. So I had the students get out uh, the material for week one, ask them to turn to the page in the book that's referenced by the material. The student didn't know what I was talking about, so I turned to the reference page. The student asked, how I knew what page to turn to. Now, as an instructor, you know, you tend to enjoy the moments when the light bulb goes off of the kid's head, you know. Some previously mystifying concept becomes clear, and as an instructor, you feel like you've done your job right. But in this case, the light came on when the student realized that books have page numbers. That means for the entire 12 years of their compulsory education, which ended with a high school diploma, this student had never once cracked a book. And while I was at that time surprised, it helped cement the fact that, yes, schools were now churning out illiterate ignorami. Oftentimes, you know, students would be assigned to write a research paper. They typically weren't very long, a page or two. The English used was almost always subpar at best. It got a lot of low marks for me as a result. The deal is that you have to write documentation in IT, and you have to be comprehensible. Now, the worst of these earned a spot where it was pinned to the wall by my desk. It was supposedly a one-page uh, research paper, but instead it was one completely incoherent sentence. The most memorable incident, fortunately, was not in my class. However, everybody who was at ITT Tech at the time knows it, and if you're one of my former students, you probably know it too. A student got into an argument with his PhD level math instructor. And this was a guy who taught at ITT Tech in the evenings just because he liked teaching so much. He was employed elsewhere, you know, a real college or university someplace. He just liked teaching. He was brilliant. The guy was basically blind and, and he still had a PhD in mathematics. Um, sadly, he got, died of cancer far too early in his life. But he got into it with his student. The student c insisted that division by zero was possible. Now, if you know anything about math, that's like one of the first concepts you ever get a, uh, if the, the moment that you get into division, you just, you can't divide by zero. It's just not possible. Yeah, okay, you get into some higher mathematics, you can sort of do it. But every day, average mathematics, division by zero is impossible. So as the instructor, instructor tried to explain this, the student got a lot more hostile. Eventually, he just completely stormed out of class. He then went straight to administration and attempted to file a grievance against the instructor on the basis that the instructor was anti-Semitic. Fortunately, unbeknownst to the student, said instructor was Jewish. Those are just some of my more memorable examples. I am literally overflowing with them. If you've got a few hours and quite a lot of beer, I will talk about them at length. Today's schools are churning out nothing but illiterate ignorami, who can neither read nor write nor perform the most basic math. So why is it like this? Well, there are a number of ways that I know this, but basically, if we say you were 100 or so years ago and you're teaching in a one-room schoolhouse where you have to teach a number of different students at a number of different levels, well, you have to have an educational level that's like up here someplace. It's really pretty high. But then what they said to themselves was, you know, there's some things we're teaching here that really aren't necessary anymore. Let's take them out of the curriculum. So the next generation of teachers only learned this much. And they said to themselves, hey, there's things in this curriculum that don't make any sense. Let's take it out. And the next generation of teachers only learned this much. And they did the same thing. The next generation did the same thing. And eventually we're down to about here, where we basically have the illiterate teaching the illiterate. 
Now that may not be precisely exactly true, but it's damned close. And what have they substituted it for? Indoctrination. Indoctrination for 12 years in communist and socialist philosophies that are absolutely deadly. Now the problem has reached a breaking point because of modern politics. Now understand that almost certainly anyone that is watching me, this probably applies to. You're probably not going to like it because what I say probably applies to you. Now understand that I don't blame anyone for being an illiterate ignoramai. I blame your teachers. But we have a huge problem because of the rampant ignorance. The situation surrounding the current impeachment political theater and Donald Trump is complex. It requires an educated populace in order to unpack it. But we don't have an educated populace. We don't even have a populace that can read. We have illiterate ignorami. They are dependent on a propagandist, leftist press to spoon feed them the news of the day. They are incapable of thinking critically as this was a skill that they were never taught. They are incapable of researching for themselves because they can't read. And they don't know how to do Google searches much beyond anything more than porn. They cannot understand the complex issues that underline the current political theater. They have become useful idiots, malleable by anyone who wants to feed them whatever they think will get a Democrat elected. Now, people's understanding of the U.S. government is flat-out ignorance. In a world with an educational system that worked, no American should leave sixth grade without a basic understanding of civics. You should be familiar with the constitutional powers of the federal government. You should know how many amendments make up the Bill of Rights. You should be at least aware of the first, second, fourth, and tenth amendments. And that's by sixth grade. There is no adult in this country who shouldn't know these things. If you don't know them, then your education failed you. You should also have been taught enough history by sixth grade to know that socialism and communism always fail, killing millions in the process. You should know that the entire 20th century is little more than a history book detailing this. You should know that socialism has destroyed Venezuela. You should know that socialism destroyed the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And that's by the sixth grade. There is no adult in America who shouldn't know these things. And if you don't know them, then your education completely failed you. And it's clear that many people typified by the ignoramus in chief, AOC, don't understand any of these things. They instead believe that the president is an elected king, free to enact any policy he likes. Now, people's understanding of science is also flat out ignorance. In my video, debunked climate science is not science, link to that in my description box, I show how climate science in no way involves a scientific method, so that therefore cannot be classified as a science. It is in fact a religion. However, since people are no longer have any education in science, it's easy to sell them on idiocy like man-made climate change. Our children are now indoctrinated in this, and neither you nor they have the background with which to easily disprove it. And believe me, it is easily disproven. Children like poor Greta Thunberg believe that it's those of us who understand science that stole her childhood from her. She spent her childhood worrying about imminent death from something that will never happen. Greta is one abused child among many, and I talk about it in my video, Greta Thunberg, Portrait of an Abused Child, link below. All of this has made a perfect storm of ignorance. We have people who don't understand the true political situation being fed to political theater by a propagandist press on a jihad to destroy Trump before he has a chance to be reelected. We have people who don't understand that government, and they think that the U.S. federal government essentially installs an elected king. We have people who don't understand that socialism and communism always fail, killing millions in the process, and if implemented here in the United States will mean killing themselves and their children. We have people who don't understand that the climate change doomsday scenario will never come to pass because they have no education to evaluate the science for themselves. They can neither read nor write nor perform the most basic math and so can't self-educate. And all of this is underpinned by reliance on a propagandist, leftist press constantly pushing for things that will kill people. There is no real clear solution to this problem. I wish there were. Now, I have an entire video series on America's broken schools linked to both the uh, uh, 
uh, playlist for all of those, as well as an individual one for part three, fixing the broken system. If you watch nothing else, watch those. And I could put forth something that at least could be done. And I won't go over it here. I've already done it there. But suffice to say that there are some really immediate and radical changes that are necessary. Your child is illiterate. It's also quite likely that you yourself are illiterate. My generation was poorly educated. My children really were. My, gra my great, my grandchildren and later make me fear for our lives. And this is the result of three generations of illiterate ignorami. That's all I have to say about that. So I'd like to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So thanks for watching. That's all the time that we have today for this episode of the highly acclaimed, world-renowned Tales from SYL Ranch, the BitChute channel where everyone's entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.